Hi, I'm Keith Seifert. I'm with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and I'm here today with uh, my professor, the man who introduced me to mycology 41 years ago. Oh my God. <laughs> How do these things happen? <laughs> I don't know. Bryce Kendrick, and Bryce was a professor at the University of Waterloo for about 30 years. And Bryce, why don't you tell the camera where we are right now? We are now sitting in a Gary Oak Meadow at the top of John Dean Provincial Park in British Columbia on Vancouver Island. And this is a particularly interesting place because I came up here a couple of years ago and counted hundreds and hundreds of, zero, of uh, <laughs> Lycanomphalia mushrooms which depend on uh, algae that, they, that grow on the surface. So the, the meadow is surrounded with uh, trees which are mostly either um, Gary Oaks or um, what we call on the west coast, <laughs> what do we call them well, on I the west know. coast? Bob. Oh. Uh, yeah, Bob, <laughs> Bob and Andrew. Um, yeah, it, it's a, uh, an ericaceous tree. Um, oh, you're thinking of the uh, thinking Arbutus. Of, of so, yeah, the yeah, Arbutus, Arbutus Menzesii, yeah. that's right. This is where the memory sometimes does not serve. Oh, wow. Well. Not immediately, anyway. So we'll, get, we'll explore your memory then. Yeah, oh, what's so left of it. Yeah. Or what's left of it, yeah. <laughs> so people can tell now from your accent that you're not from these parts. So can you tell us a little bit about your background and, and where you came from and how you got interested in, in biology? Yes, well, I, I was born in Liverpool, which is, a, or is or was then a very dirty industrial city. And I grew up uh, having to walk uh, a mile or so to get to the library. But we had good parks and my father was very keen on getting us out into nature. And I started collecting leaves and he bought me a leaf book. And I started to look at this leaf book and I found a leaf that was not in the book. So that caused me to explore a bit more widely and I discovered that it was the leaf of a a tree that was not native to Britain, but which came from the Carolinian forests of North America. And that is the, and what is the name of the tree? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Papa. Yeah, yeah. So um, once I had found out that this uh, ericaceous tree, I didn't even know what the family ericaceae meant at the time, but uh, I knew that it was a very different tree from anything local. And that sparked my interest in, uh, in the wider field of biology. I also uh, lived on the edge of the ocean and we used to go to the beach at Formby and Freshfield and go swimming in the Mersey, which was a fairly polluted river at the time. And it was exciting because there were the, the wrecks of many ships that had been torpedoed there during the war. And I have lots of stories about the Second World War that don't belong here, have nothing to do with biology or mycology, but still. Um, and I found in the sea where I was swimming these little tiny semi-transparent, almost transparent creatures swimming around. And I put some in a jar and took them home. And next morning they had vanished. So this piqued my curiosity and I had to find out what they were. They were sea gooseberries. They were members of the phylum Tinophora. Huh. And they are some of the most beautiful objects in the world because they have rows of flagella that march down the sides of the jelly and that beat in a, in a metasynchronous rhythm. Okay. And when the light shines on them, they refract the light and send out little rainbows. So they're incredibly beautiful things. So that again made me very interested. And we took courses in marine biology. We had a field course in the Isle of Man. And there was a lab there owned by the University of Liverpool where I went with my high school group. And uh, we looked at some of the things that were growing there. Again, a lot of members of the uh, the various different phyla that one expects in the marine situation, which you never see on land, dead man's fingers and things like that. So uh, yeah, I was very clued into biology from a pretty early age.
So your father was, what did your father do? He worked for Meccano and he was an income tax clerk. Not he, Meccano, he, the toy company? Yes, the toy company. Meccano, Dinky Toys, Hornby electric trains. And I, of course, was well supplied with all of those things. So <laughs> if I had been going to be an engineer, this would have set me on the right track for that. But it, I was interested in them, but it didn't take. The biology took, and marine biology especially. So when I went to university, I, I tended to focus rather on that, that aspect of things. So you went to university at in the, the University of Liverpool because uh, we had just got rid of a conservative government at the end of the war. And the, the new Labour government decided that anybody who had the ability to take advantage of university education should get it. So I was given free tuition, etc., to go to the University of Liverpool. And admittedly, I had to run, run my sixth year twice, sixth form year twice, because I was too young to go to university the first time I did it. But when I was 17, I went. And when I was 24, I finished my PhD. But there's a lot in between. 24, that's pretty young. Yeah, well, it just went straight through. It took me seven years, three years undergraduate, four years undergraduate, and three years in uh, graduate school. So, so who were your uh, mentors? Like, who were, the, who were the people who were supervising your theses? Well, I had a, a very interesting young plant physiologist who used to took us, take us out to interesting locations not far from Liverpool, like um, salt flats. And, and uh, at one point we went up on a field course to Malham in Yorkshire and uh, explored the limestone pavements there. So there are a lot of very unusual plants growing there, which really excited me. And um, I think from then on, it was, it was the botanical side that interested me, not, not the zoological. Although I'd started off being more interested in animals, marine animals and so on, but then I got into the plant side. And it seemed to me that the people in the botany department were more accessible than the people in the zoology department. The zoology department had long corridors and big doors and they were always closed. The botany department had short corridors and lower doors and they were often open. <laughs> so you were able to talk to the profs. And I had a very inspiring uh, lady prof in first year and her name was Marjorie Knight and she was an algologist. She discovered the life cycle of one of the brown algae. Oh, okay. and, um, she was an amazing character. She had lost a leg somewhere, so she went around on crutches, and she smoked like a chimney. But uh, she, and she, she coughed when she breathed in the chalk dust <laughs> from the blackboard. But we, she fascinated us, and I can remember coming up behind me, her coming up behind me during a lab and say, "Mr. Kendrick, I'm sure you can do much better than that." <laughs> so she was both. Uh, stimulating and uh, invigorating and somehow authoritarian. She, she pushed you and uh, she was great. And she became Dame Marjorie Knight and she retired to the Isle of Man and ran a pottery there for many okay. years. So she was a, a fascinating woman. I had another uh, woman who was a prof, an algology prof too. And um, the year my mother died, she took pity on me and took me on a field course that she was running a, a research problem in the Isle of Man again at Port Erin, which is where the marine biology courses had been. And we had a diver who went down to the bottom of the, uh, the bay and charted the positions of various algae and so on. And I was doing various things in the boat, like triangulating our position and so on. And uh, she was very interested, very interesting. Her name was Elsie. 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 Oh, you knew her by first name. I oh. knew her by first name, yeah. <laughs> uh, although she was a fair, somewhat stiff individual, she had a very attractive young daughter that I was totally enamored of, who was oh, along okay. on a trip, so oh, that's not that was college. a plus. But anyway, um, <laughs> so she was an algologist, and I was kind of drawn towards the idea of working with her for a, a graduate degree. And then I looked at what had happened to the various students that had taken honors with her. And they all got third class honors, which disqualified them from doing graduate work essentially. Oh. 
So I said, I can't throw myself in that particular pyre. And uh, about that time, we got a new faculty member from Australia, a, an Australian uh, professor who came by, by, way of Queen, by way of Queen Mary College. And he was a mycologist, and he had looked at the decay of the, uh, the leaves of the she-oak, a casuarina, in Australia, which is where he came from, of course. And um, when I asked him if I could do uh, honors with him, he said yes. And so I got an immediate batch, an immediate exposure to mycology because he took us out into the woods, the pine woods, and showed us various uh, mushrooms and things. And I wasn't totally into mushrooms, but he seemed to me to be a very um, impressive academic because he had come from a long way away and he was the new chairman of the department and he had some clout. So when I finished my uh, honours and got a 2-1, nobody at Liverpool had ever got a 1 by that time, although mm. somebody did later on. But so and I, I said, would he take me on as a grad student? And he did. And it was almost disastrous because he was a terrible supervisor. <laughs> he was uh, overbearing and um, authoritarian and he was never there because he was into, uni into universities counts for, for higher education overseas yeah. which meant in the Commonwealth so anyway he was really in so he fortunately hired a young guy by the name of Dennis Parkinson who came from a women's college in London to teach at Liverpool and he arrived just in time to save me from from the flames because I had been given a project uh, by, the, by this guy and he said, look, when we isolate fungi from the soil, most of, we get, most of the ones we get are light colored. But when we look at fungi in the soil, most of the hyphae we see are darkly colored. Can you find out what the connection is there? So I started, I started isolating these dark hyphae and they're all dead, of course. So, um, Eventually, Dennis came along. Dennis Parkinson said, well, he says, let's, let's look at the different layers and see what happens from one to the next. And so I started dividing the, uh, the organic layer of the forest floor. This was a Scots pine forest in Cheshire. And I divided it up into layers. And fortunately, the, uh, the Scandinavians had done all this before me. So I was able to pick up the names, the L, yeah, the yeah, F, the F1, yeah. the F2, the H. And although their Swedish name or the Danish name is Humultnest, Humus Kicknet, I, used, I just called it the Humus layer. Yeah. And, the, and the F layer was the Fumultnings Kicknet or something, and I just named that the fermentation layer. So this was much simpler for me to deal with. And I then started making observations and setting up experiments, and uh, these things worked out. So I, get, I was able eventually to establish a kind of a series of fungal zones that progressed through the different layers of the forest. And in the, so doing, I found some new fungi. Yeah. And that was the big key. I found two new hyphomycetes. One of them we called uh, Helicoma, and it's been kicked around since then, now has its own genus. So that's the same it's, one we found in your yes, front yard here. We found it in my front ago. yard, grow, growing <laughs> on a completely different pine tree. Yeah. A, on a Californian pine, yes. yes. And the other was, of course, Thysanophora. No, no that was it? another new one, oh, but okay. the new, the Sympodiella, a Sympodiella, new genus, okay. a new genus. And it's still a new genus, still a good genus, and it has more species now. Yeah. So, uh, so that was very exciting. So I got to go down to London, I met Martin Ellis and um, talked to him about these various things and he said, oh yeah, that's a new species, new species of helicoma. Well, he and I were both wrong. It wasn't in a helicoma at all. And it was many years before it was finally put in its own genus yeah. and that's a whole different story. Indeed. But that, this goes into the way in which you gradually develop a deeper understanding of these things the more you work with them. Well, it's something can be can be true at the time you do it, yeah. and then thirty years from now, it, there's a new truth to be discovered. You know, and, yes. and, and, and so the whole field just kind of 
evolves? Well, at that point, we were just looking at helicospores. They just curved around. Okay, if it's a helicospore and it's growing on a single conidiophore, it's probably a helicoma. But the fact was, helicoma was a thing that produced its spores by growing sympodially and uh, producing them on teeth and things like that, which this didn't. This was a single spore sitting on the end of a hypha. Yeah. So it, it didn't fit into helicoma ultimately, and now it's, it's got its own name, which is Slimacomyces. Slimacomyces. Slimacomyces, yeah. So and it's still mono, monotypic, I think. I think. Maybe there's another species now. I, mean, I think there might be one from China there. Hey, but, it's but, probably. Um, so, so, and then at some point you, you graduated and, and you moved to Canada. So uh, what, what, what was behind the, the move to Canada and, and, and how was that? Well, uh, when I finished my PhD and got it through the, the, the Viva, um, I was looking for a job and they said to me, if you um, come in a year or so, we can probably get your job at Kew in the CMI and that kind of thing because they were still in an expansion phase, I guess. Uh, however, there were two other jobs that came up at the same time. One was at the University College of the West Indies in Kingston, Jamaica, mm. and the other one was a postdoc in Canada with Stan Hughes in Ottawa. And I didn't think I was quite ready to go out and teach in the tropics, because I knew nothing about them. I'd never been there. And I thought the idea of... Uh, working in, a, in an English-speaking country with somebody who was already a, a very, very famous person in the field that I was interested in was more encouraging. So I chose the Canadian route and I never got to graduate because I was on the ship coming to Canada when okay. I should have been wearing my motorboard and robes. I've never worn them. <laughs> on, the, on the ship, right? So that, yeah. it was kind of a one-way trip. Yeah, it was a one-way trip. Days, right? I never went back. Yeah. And if, after I'd been here a year, the Canadian government offered me a job in the group that I was working in, and which has changed names several times yeah, since then. Yeah. Well, and and so then you went to Waterloo, and so I was a student at Waterloo. And one one thing that was striking about that department to me was that it was basically all expats of. <laughs> you know, from different countries, the United States, from from yeah. the UK. So, what was it like? You know, making that transition from a from a, I guess, really a postdoc and government scientist into yeah. a teacher. Yes. Well, I I had been at, with the with the government for five years at this point. I was pretty fed up with the bureaucracy. I don't like bureaucracy, and I I don't like red tape and things. So. Uh, the idea of a university job began to be more attractive all the time. And at that point, the person who had been the chairman at the University of Liverpool moved to Waterloo and built, started to build a new department. And the year I went, the faculty went up from 7 to 12. Mm. And he, uh, he had hired people from all over the place. As you say, he got people from the States, he got people from England. And uh, it, it was a growing department, and NSEC was doing quite well. I liked the idea of, not as I didn't know it at the time, becoming a small businessman, but that's basically what you are as a faculty member. You have to go out and get money to keep your students. Well, at least I had to do yeah. this. I had to get grant money. And uh, on the one hand, that was stressful, but on the other hand, it was... It was a chance to expand, to, to explore new ideas and new areas. So if you look at my CV, you find we, wa we wandered off into various corners of what the hyphomycetes might and might not be doing, well, in growing in, in streams and growing in ponds. You seem to let your students do, to follow wherever their nose, noses took them. So yeah. They, yeah, you had students working on mycorrhizae, on aquatic hyphomycetes. Yes. aquatic hyphomycetes, that's, coelomycetes. That's true. I, I thought if they had a bent for something, they should do it. And as long as it was mycological and as long as it was to do with what they used to call imperfect fungi, I was happy with it. So we never did, uh, well actually I did have a student who worked on mushrooms, but that was, that was because he absolutely insisted on it. Yeah. And I said, you know, 
you never get a job in mushrooms, but you get a job in molds. And you know what he finished working up? He finished working with aerobiology with molds and buildings. <laughs> and he's still doing that. That's the we. Umpty, umpty years later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was... Um, but generally, yeah, I like to let them do what they wanted to do. So there's, there's one thing I wanted to talk to you because about... And I don't think we've ever discussed this really, and and that's the Kananaskis conferences. So you organized these two conferences in the 1970s. That uh, the second one in particular ended up being quite a seminal uh, meeting in the field. So I I'm curious how it how you came up with the, just the thought to have these conferences and how you managed to organize them and. Mm. Um, it's difficult to remember all the details at this point, but. Um, I'd been to a botanical congress uh, and I thought, wow, the potential of a meeting of this kind but, but restricted to people in the one discipline was very attractive to me. So I thought if we can get people like Subramanian from India and people like uh, Chris Perzinski from England and Martin Ellis and uh, so on together, to talk about this particular group of fungi was, was kind of exciting. And in fact, when they got together the first time, even at the first Kernaskis, a lot of sparks were struck. I think it, you really have to get people together and kind of lock them up in the same room to make them interact at that kind of level. So good sparks, not, not yes, good. Well, <laughs> yes, mostly good sparks, <laughs> uh, yeah. And we got people together who were looking with the with, the, with the electron microscopes at these fungi and looking at the the fine structure and people who were looking at the development and people were looking at the ecology and you kind of stir them all together and they come up with with new things. So did they were they all self funded? Did they come on their own dime or did I, you have to find money? I had to find money to bring several of them, and I applied for a grant. And of course it was inadequate to run the whole thing, but I, we had a very cheap venue in the forestry lab at Kanaskis, and it was a beautiful place to be. And we had a couple of great field trips into the Rockies during the course. So uh, well, it wasn't a course, it was a confab. A confab. Yes. But one of the things that's very striking about both those books is the transcriptions of the discussions, <laughs> yes. which as a student, and I know a lot of my colleagues who also were influenced by those books, we probably read the discussions more than we read the papers, because that was where the development of the ideas was articulated. And, and uh, so was there a precedent for that? I think that Ron Peterson had done a book on Basidiomyces that also had transcribed Something like that. But I, I felt very strongly that the discussions could be the nub of the whole thing. Because, you know, a, a presentation, a paper, uh, is it possibly a chapter in a book, but the, the, the literature is full of that stuff. Yeah. What it's not full of is the minutiae of the interactions of the people who write the papers. And frequently, what led to the papers, it never gets into the paper. So it's, it's best to let these people stew among themselves and, and then try to transcribe as much as possible. I, I really tried very hard. It took me months I bet. to do that, all those transcriptions. But yeah. yes, I found that they were a, an important part of the book, so, the so two books. Yeah, the two books. And, and so the National Museum paid to publish them. Yeah. So, so the. The program was seminar presentations followed by discussions, or yes. was it more organic? I, I guess think the discussions would be organic. Yes, the sem there were seminars. People talked about what they wanted to, and then the rest of us piled in and said, well, but, if, and when, and so on, and uh, kind of tried to uh, draw more out of them or push them into corners. And this is when people are often the most revealing. <laughs> sure. And you know what's striking about some of those discussions is that we're still talking about some of those things today. And yes. one thing that comes to mind is the term Allurio uh, canidium and Chlamydospore, which were, were kind of discussed at that conference. And, mm. and there was really no resolution. Not no. Other than that, maybe we shouldn't use those terms because yeah. they're not well defined. But no. people still use them and, yes. or, or not. <laughs> you know, reviewers say, oh, you shouldn't use that term. but. But it captures that that discussion. So we don't read that kind of discussion. We don't really see that so much anymore. Yeah. 
And so an another thing that was very striking about, about, about your career after that time was that you became this kind of publishing entrepreneur, uh, you know, and, and so, and, and that's very interesting too. And you mentioned that, that you know, that, that being a professor in a way had that entrepreneurial expectation, but, but even nowadays we, we have people who are, who's kind of set up their own little publishing company around their labs or or broader and I, I think you were kind of an inspiration for some of that so so what what led you to 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 go in that direction well uh, John Semple and I did a a textbook for a second year course which covered the whole of you know he dealt with the plants and I dealt with the algae and the fungi and uh, we put it together as a kind of a ring bound thing but then I decided that I wanted something more specific to the fungi for the third and fourth year courses. And uh, it, it led to my writing a series of chapters to try and cover everything I possibly could, which has expanded since then. But um, at the time, I thought it was fairly comprehensive. And I, I borrowed $5,000 from the bank and went to a guy up in Owen Sound who was a kind of a small publisher. And he produced the first edition of the Fifth Kingdom, which is a, a, a horrible thing in the sense because they stapled it together with giant <laughs> staples. And I remember somebody uh, getting in touch with me saying, the first thing I did was rip those staples out. Oh, really? And <laughs> yeah. what did they do? Put it in a bind? I don't. They must have bound it some <laughs> other way. But the, yeah, that was, that was an inspiration because the guy encouraged me and I got my $5,000 back eventually. So I then went on and did a second edition and that got picked up by a guy in the States. I'm sorry he wasn't able to stay in Canada but the Canadian publishers were not keen on laying out money and at that point I didn't want to go borrowing anymore. So they put out the money for the second and the third editions and um, when it came to the fourth edition I had a, a new US publisher because my uh, original US guy had retired and these people wanted a much more gussied up a version. So they said, we'll put some color in. We'll allow you to expand, add extra chapters if you want, expand chapters. Um, and so I, I was catapulted into that at the age of about 82. <laughs> I, said, I didn't really totally want to do it, but I didn't not want to do it. I didn't want it not to be done, you know, so I got, got myself into the gear again. So the first edition came out in 1985 and the last edition, the fourth edition, came out in 2011. So that's quite a long stretch there, yeah. particularly since the third edition came out in 2001. So we've got uh, ten, years. 10 more, 17 years. Yeah. 16, 17 years between the two editions. It was really too out of date. And I found that when I was teaching this course at, um, at Banfield this year, that uh, some of the students, they were supposed to get my fourth edition, but that's quite expensive. It's 500 pages, etc., And it's expensive to ship. So uh, they had taken advantage of an offer from the publisher to buy the third edition for a lot less money. But there's a lot of stuff that's not in the third edition, yeah, which imagine. we now need to know. All the molecular stuff is new from the between the second, the third, and the fourth edition, and lots of stuff about fungicides and uh, things like the kinds of ways in which we exploit fungi have broadened out. There's uh, stuff about you know fungi made from f fungal mycelia and car parts oh, yeah. and so on, so that uh, the uses of fungi have multiplied. And things like the strobel urines, which I had never anticipated because I was wandering through the forests up here and finding these little tiny white mushrooms growing on last year's uh, Douglas fir cones. I had no idea. I knew they were called strobel urines. Yeah which is a good name for them because they grow on cones but I had no idea at that point that the uh, they were responsible for this huge outbreak of, of um, fungicides which affected almost all groups of fungi you say yeah. they don't deal with, Doesn't work with fusarium, fusarium very well. <laughs> that's too bad 
So the the banana <laughs> disease is not unfortunately unfortunately no. cured. Yeah. No, it's not registered to use with fusarium. No, interesting that. Yeah. So last night I, w I was looking at uh, the diplomas that you and awards that you have hung up on your home lab yeah, wall office wall <laughs> and and saw the your your distinguished mycologist award from the mycological society of america from 1995 yeah. and and i was there when when you got that award and and i remember uh, you made a very short speech and and it was basically that i owe all of this to my students and and so i'd like you to talk about that relationship that you've had with with students and continue to have now well i think what i discovered uh, this summer uh, at Banfield was that the thing I enjoy doing most is teaching undergraduates. This is this beats almost any other occupation I can think of by a country mile because their minds have reached a level where they can grasp some of the concepts and they're also possibly capable of being, becoming enthused by something. By let, having ideas grab a hold of them. You don't see that in small children. I used to think I'd like teaching small children, it's not true. So these undergraduates aged between 21 and 26 were just the perfect uh, group for me to work with. They came from several different universities and they had different backgrounds, but they uniformly became very keen on the fungi that we call, they call themselves myco nerds now. <laughs> and and they're, they're still corresponding with me months after the course is over and sending me pictures of fungi and things like that. And uh, I think I go back far enough, I think that must have been happening all through the times I was teaching at Waterloo because the, the occasional undergraduate would become a graduate and then others came from somewhere else. but. The, the idea of having someone who is looking at something different from what you're interested in, but is now able to communicate to you something exciting about that area that you didn't know. And so I, I remember, for example, Mark Brundrett, who is now in West Australia and has written a wonderful book about West Australian orchids, um, working on the the arrangements of mycorrhizal fungi in the spring flora in the woods near where he lived. And it was absolutely amazing to see the timing of the entry of the endomycorrhizal fungi into the roots of those plants as it related to the leafing out and flowering of those plants. Sometimes they were totally out of phase. Yeah. I, was, I was, you know, stunned by that. I couldn't understand what it was all about. but. Um, the thing with mycorrhizal fungi is I've been reading a few papers lately and all they do is confuse me because um, one of my ex-students, who is now a prof at uh, UBC in Okanagan, did some very good papers on endomycorrhizal fungi and he found that they are as often harmful to the plant as they are beneficial to it. Hmm. Well that just blew me out of the water because I had been brought up on this concept that the mycorrhiza was always a beneficial a mutualistic symbiosis and it isn't. So where do we go from there? I have read these papers, I can't make sense of them. I want to sit down with him and talk about it but I don't know when that's going to happen. Maybe next fall. Well, yeah, I think so the, the students all through. See yeah. you, you got you and Gracia and one or two other people who are working on this hyphomycetes on dung thing. Yeah. Well, I was very keen on that as an undergraduate exercise, but there, there's been some amazing fungi I discovered on dung. Just, just gorgeous things. Yeah, I've grown out of that phase now, but yeah, uh, you don't. I remember well, it fondly. <laughs> I used it again in the at the uh, Banfield field course, and we got some magnificent things. Uh, it strangely enough went straight from from uh, Pyelopolis into the, uh, the mushroom phase. The, there was very little in the way of ascomycetes in between. But in our years with the horse dung, we got, used to get a long sequence. So you're not looking at dung anymore. Not very often. <laughs> we, we have deer in the yard and I sometimes yeah. pick it up in the spring, but yeah. you know, I see, see Polaria and that's about it. Yeah. I think they're, they have a boring diet in the winter. Yeah, think, so. yeah. Well, this is one of the problems, isn't it, of getting dung that's got the right ingredients. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So yes, uh, uh, I, I credit graduate students with en enriching my life tremendously because they they opened up areas that, I, that, as far as I'm concerned, were locked, and they they exposed them to me, and just as I hope I was exposing certain things to them on the way in. Yeah. <laughs> then they take off on their own like racehorses. Well, they yeah. should. Well, and yeah, they that... did, they did. I mean, look look at John uh, Kay, yeah. he's a fellow of the Royal Society now. Well, I, th I think that, you know, you, you have you exemplify um, a lot of what this kind of professorial academic lifetime relationship is like for a lot of people in science, you know, and, and you've managed to keep in touch with a lot of the students that you've had, and they've wanted to keep in touch with you. you know? mm. It's it's a permanent kind of relationship, right? Seems it's, to me. It's not a transient thing. Should go on yeah. forever. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, we'll see how it goes. Well, we have but. little get-togethers get of grad students who can actually find the time to come and celebrate my birthday at off, off months, because who wants to come in December? Yeah. So they came at different times of the year, and uh, we had a slightly wet weekend where we explored all kinds of ideas and old old uh, friendships and that was very good i'd like to expand that but our house isn't very big yeah <laughs> so you retired at a, a little bit 60. ahead of schedule and 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 moved out here to to victoria and it's like in a way you kind of moved back to where you started you know living living on a uh, in a coastal environment and yes. back of, of, i think your plan was to to uh, explore marine organisms again, and and uh, I did. So you've done that, but you've also unexpectedly done other things. And so, if you want to talk for a few minutes about about the environmental uh, aspect of your retirement, okay. Well, I knew I, you know, we used as a family to go out east one year and out west the next year, and we alternated these things. And we finally decided after several alternations that we wanted to finish up on the west coast. So in 19, uh, in the 80s, I started looking. So I came to a conference at UBC and I came over to you, to Victoria and I got a real estate agent who very smartly had advertised in the University of Waterloo newsletter. Hmm. Interested in retirement or investment property? call me any time of day or night. So she took me around and I found a, a place that I liked the look of. So I was taking video of everything and I took it back and showed Laurie and Laurie says, nope, it's too big. She says, I want something on the waterfront. So next year I said, you come with me. So she came out and we did the, the routine again. We found the place we're in, which was a bit of a wreck. But anyway, my main aim in coming out here was to get into a new biome, a different biome from the one I was living in. Now it's not as rich in trees as the one in the east because we don't have any Carolinian forest. It was all pretty well, everything was scraped off here. But we do have a lot of interesting plants and animals, birds that were not present in the east. Um, it's absolutely wonderful to be surrounded as we are where I sit on the edge of the ocean with there's birds every day, every day of the year. There's hummingbirds. We have anas, hummingbirds coming and exploring everything. And, and we have uh, juncos, dark-eyed juncos, big bunch of them around. And uh, siskins and, and crossbills and all kinds of strange things come through. And we have a, two or three eagles that sit at the top of a tree next to us and talk. They don't nest there, but they stay there for hours at a time. And uh, so I, thought I, I enjoyed that, but I'm not a, I'm not a real birder. I'm, an, I'm a kind of a semi-keen birder. I'm interested in them, but I don't spend a lot of time looking for LBJs. Um, and I don't know where everyone is in the, in the bird book, like the people in South <laughs> Africa did. Um, but I then started looking at the marine organisms again, and I compiled a CD of with 650 species in it over a period of about five years after I got out here. And I still go back and look at that because it's got all kinds of pictures of things I'm not seeing as often anymore. And that makes me wonder because uh, I've been back to Heron Island several times since my original visit in the early 70s. 
And each time I've gone back, it seems that there is somewhat less biodiversity than there was the last time I came. And this bothers me because I think it's happening around here, around this peninsula. I can see there are algae that I'm not seeing anymore. There are invertebrates that I'm not seeing anymore. And I just wonder whether this has to do with temperature change, climate change, whether it's got to do with um, man's incursions on the ocean, the pollution, or what. It just seems there's a slight withering away, and the same thing seems to have happened with birds and mammals. They've all declined quite strongly over the last decade or so. And this, this bothers me. So I thought I was coming out to paradise here, and that I would relax and just look at the oceans and the forests, and the forests here are wonderful, of course, we've got some great trees. But in fact, all I do is worry about them. And then that got me into the concept of uh, going out and trying to get rid of invasive plants. And I've now spent a good chunk of the last three years cutting broom. And I started off cutting broom that was 15 feet high, <laughs> and now I'm down to cutting broom that's maybe three feet high, but we're getting rid of it. And it, 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 you can't do it everywhere because it grows all along the highways. And when the last time I flew back from San Francisco, I saw a ba band of yellow all the way up the coast. You can't get rid of it. But we can get rid of it in a park or a reserve, and we can keep it that way and, and help some of the rare plants that grow there to flourish. And that's what I'm engaged in now, as much as anything else. And I'm gathering material for the fifth edition of the book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well... Have you done me? I've done you. Thanks, Bryce. That, that was... Uh, that was great, and I just—I should say, uh, happy birthday to you! Oh, thank you. Someone's it's having coming his up soon. Eighty-fifth yeah. birthday in two days from now. So, um, and I wanted to do this interview up here at this spot because we've been up here several times yes. together, and we've been out around and about this peninsula. And Quite I've a few I've, times. I've watched you uh, cutting the broom out, so I. <laughs> Yeah. You you remain an inspiration. So thank you thank for you. everything.